Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. The last guest paid, lavishing the waitresses with his snow white smile. Waiting for him to leave, the director closed the facility and prepared to go home. Okay, girls, good work today. Get the tips from the bartender. He commanded and went to his office. It was the janitor Austin's turn, meanwhile. He came to work here three months ago and quickly made friends with the staff. It was because the waitresses liked him. Austin was a young guy of 23 and looked fit, even athletic. Except he didn't have a good education. He spent his childhood in an orphanage. Sometimes he stayed in foster families, but he didn't stay there long and ran away from his new parents. But he never knew his biological parents. And if at first, he waited for them to come and take him home. After a while, he lost hope and stopped hoping for a miracle. After he left the orphanage, he immediately went to look for a job. But they all required education and experience, and he had none of that. He was offered a job as a longshoreman, but for very little money and no days off. Austin accepted the job because he needed money to live on. But one day, he got a newspaper where he found an ad, a janitor needed in a restaurant. The next day, he went there and had an interview. The owner, Mr. Preston Blankenship, hired him without too many questions. That's how Austin settled in, becoming a favorite member of the staff. That night, he cleaned the place more carefully than usual. Preston was expecting a sanitary inspection any day now and asked Austin to make everything perfectly tidy. When he had finished cleaning, he put all the garbage in a big bag and took it outside. There was a garbage container, which a special machine emptied every morning. And in general, the restaurant owner, though he was a bit harsh, was still considered a fair employer. He did not tolerate that the kitchen and other rooms were untidy. For that, Preston paid good money to his employees. It was getting dark outside when Austin came out with a bag of garbage. But before he reached the garbage container, he saw a girl on a bench. She was crying, with her hands tightly covering her face. Austin wondered what happened. Coming closer, the boy tried to calm her down. Hey, are you okay? Wipe away the tears. What happened? He said cheerfully, but the girl did not stop crying. Austin walked over to her and sat down beside her after he threw the garbage into the container. He could see that she was very exhausted and was really in trouble. Not only that, Austin noticed her clothes, old, shabby, and in some places, torn. In his mind, he immediately thought, could it be a beggar or a crime victim? And another thing Austin noted was that the girl was pregnant. Her hands were shaking. My name is Austin. I work here. The janitor began the conversation. And I'm Haley. She answered uncertainly. Austin almost choked when he looked at her. After she reacted to his words and turned to him, he saw a lean and frail creature, and that belly that bulged slightly was the only confirmation that she still had the strength to hold on, though she could have gotten rid of the baby. Austin wanted to ask her a question again, but Haley was ahead of him. I'm sorry to be so rude, but I'm starving, and I need something to eat. Maybe at least some bread or anything else? There's nothing left at home. My stepfather drank it all away. I even planned to run away with my boyfriend, but he turned out to be a sneaky man, and now I don't have any choice. Well, not an easy situation, Austin said with a heavy sigh. He thought it would be a good idea to feed her. After all, it is possible to take a risk. The guard is asleep anyway. He does it all the time because he's not afraid of anyone. Anyway. 
Austin decided that nothing bad would happen if he invited Haley into the kitchen. There were sometimes leftovers that customers had paid for but hadn't finished, or simply refused for whatever reason. Taking Haley by the hand, he showed her to the door. Come, I'll get you something to eat. Austin led Haley inside the kitchen. There were some salads and some meat. No one was pushing him. The owner knew Austin might stay late, especially since an inspection was coming soon. So the fact that Austin was still there would hardly have alarmed anyone. After Haley had greedily eaten everything, Austin washed the dishes and put them away. The girl stopped crying and smiled for the first time. Thank you from both of us, she said, stroking her belly. You're welcome, it's just food, Austin said. But don't tell anyone I fed you, or my boss might find me or even fire me. Okay, you don't have to worry about that, replied Haley, and I don't have anyone to tell. My stepfather doesn't care what's going on with me. He's more interested in the booze. In addition to the salads and meat, there were still some cheese delicacies and desserts, and Austin packed them carefully and handed them to Haley with the words. That's for later, but don't feed your stepfather. Let him get food himself. You are a magician, said the girl, and tears came out of her eyes again. Don't cry, everything will be all right. Austin reassured her. I am sure that you will have a silver lining in your life. It cannot be otherwise. I hope so too, Haley replied and walked out of the kitchen. Austin stood for a minute, looked around, made sure everything was all right, and left the restaurant too. He had done a good deed that evening. He had saved a pregnant woman from starvation. At the bus stop, out of the corner of his eye, he noticed Haley turning the corner of some dingy gray building which seemed to be where she lived. But the janitor didn't dare catch up with her to walk her to her place. Meanwhile, as she approached the entryway, Haley looked at the third floor windows, where the lights were on, and realized that her stepfather was awake. It looked like he hadn't found any liquor, or hadn't had enough, so he waited for his stepdaughter to come so he could try to get some money from her or tell her to go and find money or booze. He often did this when he wanted to get drunk. At that moment, Haley found herself flooded with memories. And like a projector in a cinema, she replayed all the previous events that had led to this kind of life. Her family was considered poor, and behind her back, people said that they were poor or even beggars. Haley had never seen or known her biological father. Her mother had never spoken of him. There were no memories of him at home, and there were no pictures of him to give her any idea of him. Her stepfather, Tom, played the role of her father, but only when he needed something and could get something in return. He usually got what he wanted by using physical force, which earned him the nickname the monster. Haley called him that behind his back to distance himself from her stepfather's name. She had no desire to consider the drunkard a human being. On the contrary, she kept suggesting that he was a vile man with treacherous and cruel qualities. Her mother was different. She struggled to provide for her daughter's needs. Elaine lived at work, sometimes forgetting her own needs leaving the apartment early in the morning and coming home only late at night. Haley had learned to cook and clean herself in the meantime, and everything could be all right. A lot of people lived that way, if it hadn't been for her stepfather. He made Elaine serve him. She was like his slave. One might have thought, why did she even tolerate that? Well... She tolerated that because the apartment they lived in was a gift from Tom's parents, and Elaine didn't have her own place, so she had to put up with this tyrant. At school, things didn't go so well for Haley either. She was constantly humiliated by her peers. 
and her teachers didn't even try to stop it, but rather watched her being bullied and insulted. She had only cheap and sometimes even old clothes. She ate free lunches in the cafeteria, and other students knew this and laughed at her. Haley had done nothing wrong, except for not being wealthy, but this fact had accompanied her throughout her time at school. She often cried at night, burying her face in the pillow. She thought that if her father were there now, he would take her and her mother out of that hell. At the same time, Haley wasn't angry at her mother, knowing that she had enough to deal with. One day, they were sitting in the kitchen, eating porridge, while her stepfather slept. Darling, forgive me for not being able to create good conditions for you, cried the mother, hugging her skinny daughter. Mom, it's not your fault. We're not the only ones who live like this. Haley tried to reassure her. You'll see, surely something must change for us. And one day, there will be no problems with money. Obviously, these were just pipe dreams. But her daughter's optimism gave her mother confidence and hope for a bright future for a while. Hopefully, if God helps, this will happen, she said, wiping her tears with a handkerchief. I ask God day and night not to leave us, and I pray for you. You are my only reason for being in this life. Haley remembered these words for a long time, and she was convinced more than once that her mother was really doing her best. Not only did Elaine tolerate Tom's attacks, but she also leveled all threats against her daughter, for at the time he was still full of energy, though he had been drinking and could encroach on Haley's beauty. She couldn't let that happen, so she tried to check on her daughter more often to make sure she was okay. Perhaps that was why she didn't push Tom too much when he was drunk. He wasn't capable of having fun in his condition. On the other hand, who knows what would have happened if she had taken his bottles away from him every time. Most likely, the physical abuse would have escalated, and then Elaine would not have been able to work at all. And in that case, who would provide for her daughter? That is a question no one will ever answer. But all things must come to an end, and Tom's bullying paid off, shortly before Haley's majority. Elaine ended up in the hospital with a heart attack. Apparently, her heart had failed and her nervous system gave out. The doctors gave no prognosis, only assurances that everything was under control and there was nothing to worry about. Haley didn't know anything about medicine, and she blindly trusted the doctors. Her stepfather, on the other hand, guessed something and smiled wryly when they visited her in the hospital. This went on for weeks, until one dreadful day, Haley was told that her mother passed away. She had passed away in her sleep. No one in the hospital even noticed, and it wasn't until the morning, when the nurses came in to give her shots and put her on drips. They didn't give a damn about Elaine's health and treated her indifferently. With the help of concerned neighbors and some of her relatives, they buried Elaine. Haley then grieved for a week, unable to believe that her mother was no longer with her. She saw her in her dreams, thinking it was real, and didn't even notice her stepfather's grunts, as if he hadn't existed at all. That day, her whole life nearly fell apart. And when Haley came to her senses, she decided to change her entire existence. Sometime later, she met a guy. Or rather, he came up to her in the park and started the most casual conversation. Hi, why are you sad? Maybe we could be sad together, the guy suggested. My name is David. Hi, she said. Nice to meet you, and I'm Haley. Well, if you're not in a hurry, we can take a walk. Together they walked to the lake with the beautiful swans. Strangely enough, David had a fresh baguette with him. You wouldn't believe it, 
but I bought it for no reason, he said and started throwing small pieces of baguette to the swans. The swans swam imposingly and snatched the bread out of the water. Apparently, they liked it, because they began to flap their wings and make loud sounds. There you go. I knew that baguette would come in handy. David continued. Haley looked at him carefully, and with a smile on her face, she said, This is not the first time you came here. What makes you think that? David asked in surprise. Because the birds recognized you right away and swam up to you before you threw a baguette, replied Haley confidently. Well, you're very eye-observant, laughed David. That's right, it's not the first time that I come here. Do you like walking in the park? Haley asked. Well, yes, my house is not far from here. He answered sluggishly and cautiously, as if he was afraid to say something wrong. And also, to be honest, I wanted to meet a girl. Well, you seem to be good at it, Haley said with a smile. I can't believe the miracle happened, David said a little shyly. So do you mean you've never met anyone else before? Well, something like that. As Haley had thought at the time, this encounter had been fateful for her. She had suddenly decided that David was her future. But after he told her about his family, the girl had doubts about her choice. It turned out that David's parents were big entrepreneurs. He admitted that he was used to luxury and wealth. It was all thanks to his mom and dad, who loved him dearly. Haley also had her dignity. Although she was raised in a poor family, she was very beautiful and attractive. Not only that, but the girl's intelligence greatly exceeded David's potential. And if she had the financial means, she would have easily entered the best university. But now, she had to work at the market to survive, taking advantage of Haley's gullibility and naivety. David quickly won her over. He didn't experiment with the romantic though, because he was just a consumer, and he thought it was enough to invite her to a cafe or just for a walk in the park. David didn't buy any gifts, and Haley didn't ask him to. She believed in his sincerity and waited for him to propose to her someday, even though the guy was in no hurry to introduce her to his parents. Each time coming up with new excuses, she knew it was not a good idea to rush into things like this, so she didn't worry about anything and thought everything was fine between them. The girl soon learned that he was known as a womanizer, and it was easy for him to seduce any beautiful girl. However, Haley did not dare talk to him about it. She continued to naively hope that everything would go well between them and that they would get married soon. Apparently, she didn't realize that the encounter in the park wasn't an accident. David simply took advantage of the fact that she was walking alone and was depressed. As time passed, their feelings didn't get any stronger, at least not David's feelings. He became cold toward her, and he could be abusive if Haley asked questions. He might have had his reasons, but he could at least talk about it with the girl he thought was his soulmate. But Haley was tolerant of his mood swings. Sometimes, she just wanted to cry, but she chose a moment when no one else was around. Haley was not in the habit of sobbing on someone's shoulder and asking them to comfort her. If her mother were alive, she would not hide her emotions in front of her. But with David, Haley was reticent, not knowing how he might react to a girl's tears. And why would he show her tears if he wasn't the reason for her problems? The longer they dated, the more David disappeared. He called less frequently. He might not pick up the phone and then say he was busy or helping his parents. Haley felt a sharp coldness, not mere fatigue. It seemed that David was bored with their relationship. One day, 
he suggested they break up. And it was just near the lake where they used to feed the swans. Please try to understand me. My parents keep pushing me, saying I should be doing something important. I have to get into business, not having fun with girls. David looked her straight in the eye and insisted. But they don't even know me. Haley was shocked. What are you talking about? Do your parents even know who you spend time with? No. I thought I'd tell them later and introduce you to them. It was obvious that David was lying, and he didn't even try to hide it. It's clear. You played me. You got bored and decided to leave me, Haley stated. At that moment, David was ready for her to slap him in the face and make a scene. But she didn't. She shrugged and left the park. She kept her dignity and did not make a scene. It was not in her nature to prove anything to anyone, much less humiliate herself by asking him to stay. David ceased to exist for her from that moment on. A few days passed. As always, Haley went to the park to rest and get some fresh air. And then she happened to see David, who was already embracing the long-legged girl. She obviously liked him because she was smiling languidly and looking at him sweetly. She was also feeding the swans with him. Apparently, this was his favorite trick. Haley didn't approach them to figure things out. It was over between them, and this conversation would have gone nowhere good. She turned around and walked back home. She didn't want to see that bastard again. David had gained another trophy, and soon he would also get bored and break up with her. He seemed to have it in his nature, to draw people closer to him, to charm them with his care, and then to plunge them sharply into cold water, returning them to harsh reality. Haley took a couple of days off and didn't leave the home. All she did was cry. At the same time, her stepfather, upon learning that she had been abandoned by a rich man, mocked her. You are as naive as your mother was. She believed in me too until she realized who I really was. Haley tried to ignore his irony and constant drunken mumbling. She just didn't have the energy to argue with him or to talk to him. She wondered why life was so unfair, why the universe punished her again. For what sins is she being punished? Haley didn't know what was happening to her and why she had no luck in life. The market did not wait for her and soon hired a new worker. The girl found out about it when she got there. She was almost hysterical. After all, this was the only way she could make any money at all. But the news of the pregnancy came as a real shock. She felt unwell and bought a test, which showed two lines. There could be no doubt. David is the father. Unlike him, Haley didn't collect men or have promiscuous affairs. But at the same time, she had to figure out what to do next. Her stepfather was not to be relied upon. He would have done nothing to help her anyway, except abuse her even more. No, Haley couldn't let that happen, especially since she wasn't going to give up the baby. She planned to get out of that hell and start a new life. But the trouble was, no one would hire a pregnant girl. No one wanted to get into such trouble and hire a girl who was about to go on maternity leave. She almost lost her mind when she found herself in such a miserable situation. But she pulled herself together. She had no money, so she had to humiliate herself and ask people for alms. She had no other choice. Also. Her stepfather was constantly asking her for money for booze and cigarettes. And he didn't care at all where she would get it. And if she tried to argue with him, he threatened to kick her out of the apartment. Where would she go in such a situation? 
The miserable situation pushed her more and more to the point of humiliation. Not that everyone gave her some money, but she managed to get some cash during the day. It was enough to buy some food, and the rest was taken by her stepfather. And in this situation, she had no one to ask for help. The sheriff wouldn't help anyway. The thing is, he had come to them several times before when the neighbors complained about Tom, but he had just end up scolding him and not actually doing anything. All the sheriff did was check the liquor stores. They bribed him and he kept quiet about any violations. These memories flashed before her eyes like a short documentary film. She even felt a little uncomfortable that she had come to this point in her life, all because she had shown weakness and naively believed in pure love. David wasn't the only one to blame for her problems. It was several links in the same chain that worked together and led to such unfortunate consequences. That's where all her troubles came from. They only increased with every passing day. Going up to the apartment, Haley still hoped that her stepfather had simply forgotten to turn off the lights and was already asleep, but he had no intention of going to bed. Instead, he was awake and seemed to be waiting for her to come home. Oh, finally, she came. He growled in a drunken voice. Haley didn't answer, but her stepfather saw the bag in her hand. Stop! What are you hiding in there? I just found some clothes for myself. Haley answered uncertainly and shook with fear. Let me see. Her stepfather pulled the bag from her. He checked the bag and smiled. Good girl. You brought daddy some food. Haley had nothing to say. She went to her room in tears. All night long, she cried into her pillow, thinking about her mother. The whole world seemed to turn upside down at that moment, and everything Haley had hoped for disappeared into oblivion. Her stepfather had become even angrier since he wouldn't share this food with her, and after all, she was pregnant, and she needed to eat for two. But no one thought of that except her. The next morning, Austin arrived at work. But as soon as he had changed his clothes, the owner of the restaurant called him to his office. Everything inside him went cold at the thought that now Preston was going to scold him for not complying with the regulations. Austin realized that apparently the guard had seen him take the beggar girl into the kitchen and reported it to the chef. That was it. Now he could not only lose his bonus, but he could also be fired. When Austin knocked on the boss's office, he heard, Yes, come in. The janitor opened the door and poked his head in. You wanted to see me, Preston? Come in. We need to talk. Preston said, holding the phone near his ear. Austin sat down on a chair and waited until Preston finished his conversation. After a couple of minutes, Preston disconnected and stared at him with both eyes. Do you have any idea what I want to talk to you about? Preston, I swear, I only gave her the leftovers. Preston, I swear, I only gave her the leftovers. Austin answered guiltily. Wait, that's not what I was talking about. I'm not interested in the leftovers at all. Preston stopped him. You'd better tell me, who was that girl you fed? But, Preston, I told you it was only leftovers. But before he could finish, the man interrupted him again. I got it, I got it. Forget about the food. He waved his hands. So who is she? I saw her outside. The girl was sitting on the bench, crying. Austin began. I felt sorry for her. So I offered to feed her. By the way, she's pregnant, but I don't know which month. The owner got up from his chair and walked around the office. He looked worried about something. 
Preston looked thoughtful and paced from corner to corner. Meanwhile, Austin sat quietly in his chair, waiting for further questioning, but the owner did not torture him with questions anymore. Austin, do whatever you want, but find that girl. The words of the restaurant owner sounded like a call to action or even an order. But what for? She is just a beggar. Austin asked cautiously. You will find out later, Preston answered. And you will not regret it if you find her for me. Austin didn't dare to argue and left the office. He had to find Haley as soon as possible. Trying to remember which house she had turned behind, the janitor hurried out. Once outside, he took the same route he had taken to the bus stop, turning his head to the right. Austin saw the familiar gray building. He walked over and immediately met an elderly woman who was just coming out of the front yard. She looked at his strange appearance and asked, Dear, are you lost? No, miss, but I am looking for someone, Austin answered her. I wonder who you are looking for here. I am looking for a girl, modest but very beautiful. He tried to describe Haley briefly. Oh, we have a lot of girls like that around here, she replied with a smile. Are you looking for a good wife? I'd love to, but I have to think about it, Austin said, appreciating her humor. Oh, by the way, the girl I'm looking for, she's pregnant. Frowning her eyebrows, the elderly lady stepped closer and answered looking into his eyes. There is one pregnant girl but she's hardly fit to be a wife. Why? Austin asked. No one knows who got her pregnant, and now she doesn't know what to do with the baby, said she maliciously. Maybe she'll give birth, raise the baby, and will be the best mother. Well, well, I've seen many such girls, said the woman with a sneer. First they sleep with just anyone, and then run to the hospital for an abortion, or take their children to orphanages. I don't think all girls are like that. He tried to intercede for Haley. Darling, you are so young and so naive. The girl you're looking for lives on the third floor. Go upstairs and turn to the right. There will be a wooden door. You can't go wrong. But be careful. Her stepfather lives there too. He's a tough guy, an alcoholic, and unemployed. Thanks a lot. Austin thanked her. Good luck. She replied and continued on her way. When he stopped near the entrance, the boy did not immediately enter it. He stood for a few minutes, trying to understand the situation. The windows of the right apartment faced the courtyard. But Austin saw no one in them. Most likely they are still asleep. The janitor thought and began to walk up to the third floor. He saw a wooden door. It was all mangled with some sharp object. Apparently, it had been poked with a knife or a small axe. Remembering what the woman had said about Haley's stepfather, he thought that his friends did that to the door. Knocking on it, Austin waited for an answer. A shuffling sound was heard, followed by a coarse, unpleasant voice. Who's there? The door opened, and a shirtless man with messy hair stood on the threshold. Who are you, and why do you need Haley? He asked even more angrily. I'm her friend, and I'd like to talk to her, he said, still calmly. Oh, I see. So it was you who got her pregnant. The man snarled angrily and tried to grab Austin by the sleeve of his shirt. The janitor was a couple of decades younger, but he was very different physically. But Austin reacted in time to intercept the alcoholic's hand and put it behind his back. So can I see Haley? Now he began to ask questions. Okay, she's at home. Just let go of my hand. The alcoholic wailed. Austin slightly turned him around and tossed him aside. 
Tom fell a meter away and rattled on the empty bottles, which immediately rang through the staircase. When she heard the noise in the apartment, Haley thought it was her stepfather's friends again, but she just didn't have the energy to get out of bed. So she just asked, What's going on? Austin heard her voice and headed toward the back room. And as soon as he opened the door, his jaw nearly dropped. He saw the girl lying motionless on the bed. She looked like she was preparing for her own death. The skin on Haley's face had turned pale, and her eyes were almost unresponsive. But clenching his fists, Austin did not do anything more to this alcoholic. He walked over to the bed and ran his hand through Haley's hair. I came to get you out of here. Austin cried as the girl turned her face towards him. Haley smiled, but she was so weak that she couldn't even show how glad she was to see him again. Dialing the cab number on his phone, Austin said the address and asked for a car in half an hour. That was enough time for him to calmly pack Haley for the trip. The girl struggled to get dressed, her hands trembling so much that she couldn't get into the sleeves. Austin helped her put on her shoes and carried her out of the apartment in his arms. Then, he returned and decided to talk to Tom like a real man. After punching him in the face a couple of times, he added, If you hurt Haley again, no one will help you. Tom just nodded his head in response, afraid to say a word. He was brave only in front of his stepdaughter, and here he was confronted by a healthy, strong guy. Tom sat still and didn't move. For him, that day was the final moment before the realization of his own worthlessness. Apparently, no one else tried to talk to him like this before. But Austin came along and cleaned up this dirty swamp. Back in the cab, he told the driver the address where he needed to go. At this point, Haley came to her senses a little and cautiously asked, Where are we going? Be patient. This whole nightmare will be over soon. Austin replied, stroking her head. My boss wants to see you. He sat down next to her and hugged the girl as if she was his family member. Austin could feel Haley trembling, and he was even angrier at her stepfather. He wanted to beat him much harder, but he knew he shouldn't cross a line and break the law. On the way, they stopped near a store to buy her some water. Haley took a sip or two and got nauseous, and they had to wait until she feels better to continue driving. Finally, they were outside the restaurant. Austin tried to pick her up again. No, that's okay, I can walk, Haley replied. Austin only supported the girl under her arm to keep her from falling. Stepping carefully up the steps, Haley walked inside the restaurant. There were several guests seated at the tables, but none of them even paid her any attention, and only the manager grudgingly asked Austin. What the hell is this? Why did you bring this beggar here? I had to. The boss told me to. He said calmly. All right then. But hurry up and get her out of here so as not to scare the guests. The manager began to rush him. Austin put his arm around Haley's waist and led her to the second floor, where the owner's office was. He knocked on the door, but did not wait for an answer and entered with her. When he saw Haley on the threshold, Preston froze for a moment, then approached her and fell on his knees. Daughter, darling, it took me so long to find you. Preston cried, begging her forgiveness. Haley was confused by the fact that some strange man, even though he was the owner of the restaurant, was crawling on his knees in front of her and calling her his daughter. Pulling herself together, the girl answered him. I am not your daughter. You are mistaken. No, there's no mistake, Preston answered. You disappeared a year ago. 
I tried to find you, and now fate has rewarded me for my efforts. No, I don't know you, answered Haley and stepped aside. Austin was standing behind them, but he wasn't going to do anything, and he wouldn't stop the girl from leaving. If she had decided to leave, he would not have prevented it. The situation became tenser because it was unclear why the owner had suddenly called Haley his daughter, and she refused to accept the kinship. That's when Austin interjected himself into the conversation. Preston, maybe you can explain what's going on because I found Haley at your request. Looking at him, the owner sat down in a chair and said, I tried to find my missing daughter for a very long time and involved a private detective, but he was unsuccessful. I seem to have lost all the strings that led to my daughter. You don't have children yet, but when you do, you'll understand. How did it happen that she was missing? Austin asked. It was a year ago when she met some strange guy, the owner answered. Yes. I must say I didn't like him at first. He had the look of a predator on the prowl, and my daughter must have been his new trophy. This is so familiar, Haley whispered. What do you mean by that? Preston asked her. I went through it, too. And this is the result, she answered, pointing to her rounded belly. Well, what happened after that? Austin asked again. And then I tried to stop her from seeing this guy. But she didn't seem to listen to me. We had a big fight that day. He came to pick her up, and they disappeared. A day later, they found their car in the river where it had gone off the bridge. The cops searched the place, but there was no trace of them. So you have no idea what happened? Now Haley began to ask. I was only thinking about finding her as soon as possible. The restaurant owner answered faintly, clutching his head. But again, we're not relatives. Haley said, my mother's name was Elaine and I've never even met my biological father. The owner flinched a little when Haley said her mother's name. He stepped closer to her and almost whispered, No way. Did she lie to me? There was an awkward pause, because Preston's words threw Austin and Haley into a stupor. They didn't know how to react, or what Preston meant. Perhaps he was just losing his mind because his daughter was missing. But no, he sounded perfectly normal and even answered questions. Who lied to you? Haley asked. I don't know what to tell you, said the owner of the restaurant, sinking heavily into an armchair. We're in no hurry, Preston, said Austin, who set a chair in front of Haley and leaned on the edge of the table. Well, all right. I'll try to explain what happened years ago, he said. He began by telling how he and his wife had tried unsuccessfully to have a baby. It took them a long time until it was found out that the wife was infertile. Preston was about to lose his mind, but thanks to his wife, he pulled himself together. Brienne offered to take a course of treatment to use their last chance. They spent another year with no results. In desperation, Preston wanted to take a child from an orphanage, but his wife refused and hinted at a more radical way. She had the idea of surrogacy. Understandably, it was risky and dangerous at the time, but Preston agreed because he had no other options anyway. It took almost two months to find a suitable candidate. She turned out to be Elaine, Haley's mother. Brienne and Preston created all the necessary conditions for her. The woman didn't need anything. She lived in the country house, and they brought her food and necessary vitamins every day. The potential parents were hoping to finally have a baby. But just before the ultrasound appointment, Elaine disappeared. Preston and Brienne 
arrived at the house and it was not locked. After checking all the rooms and outbuildings, they couldn't find the surrogate mother. At that moment, they panicked. The spouses began searching for her. As time passed, Elaine never showed up. And when all the deadlines passed, she herself came and gave them the newborn baby girl. Naturally, they were very happy and immediately forgot about everything else. Preston examined the baby. It was a perfectly healthy baby girl. He called the right people and registered the girl as his biological daughter. They paid Elaine and she left their home forever. But none of them would have guessed then that the surrogate mother gave birth to two twins and she kept one of them. Apparently, she wanted to be a mother too. Most likely, Elaine gave birth in another maternity hospital so that the rich spouses would not find her. Yes, perhaps she did the wrong thing, but at that moment, she had no scruples. She decided that nothing would happen to the rich people if they only got one child because they were only paying for one. As he finished his story, Preston looked at Haley again and said, It turns out you're my daughter. My biological daughter. I'm shocked, the girl admitted. I'm embarrassed to say this, but I hope you'll forgive me for everything that happened to you, Preston muttered. I have no reason to be angry or offended, Haley replied, because you didn't even know that I existed. Besides, my mother didn't say anything either. And now, I understand why she spent her whole life to make my life at least a little better. But on the other hand, I don't know why she didn't dare to come to you, even after all these years. I'm sure you wouldn't have refused to help her. Of course, Haley, I wouldn't leave your mother alone with her problems. Preston said, putting his arm around her shoulders. But I really didn't know she had twins. My wife and I were too happy and we didn't think about checking it out. When we saw our baby girl, we just couldn't think about anything else. Don't. It's not your fault. Haley reassured him. The girl didn't try to pull away because, no matter what, her real father was standing in front of her right now. When Austin was sure that Haley was in no danger and that Preston was glad he had met her, he suddenly asked, What about your other daughter? Preston turned gloomy and answered confusedly, I have searched everything. There are no results. So what? You decided to leave it like that? Austin continued to ask. You know, replied the owner, I've been getting the feeling lately that my daughter is no longer alive. Ashley must be dead, and I am comforting myself with empty hopes. Crying, Preston sat back in his chair. He sobbed like a little child, but neither Austin nor Haley calmed him down. On the contrary, they decided that it would be easier to talk about anything after letting him express his emotions. Finally, the restaurant owner calmed down, and at that moment, someone knocked. Yes, come in. Preston, do you need any help? It was the manager. No, Tyler. You'd better go back to your duties and don't distract me. He said angrily. Austin looked at him with a smile as his eyes twinkled. Tyler, we have important matters to deal with right now. The janitor's words sounded like irony, but the manager did not respond to them. After assessing the situation, he realized that his presence was really unnecessary now. The manager closed the door and Preston continued. Okay, Austin, it's your day off. Why, in the middle of the work week? I'm the owner here. It's up to me to decide when you can have an extra day off, said Preston. Well, here are the keys to the house. I'll text you the address. Take Haley there to get her cleaned up. Oh, I almost forgot. Take the money. 
buy her everything that she needs, and to feed her well. Austin got the keys, a note with the address, and the money from Preston. He helped Haley to get up and led her through the main restaurant hall. Preston's driver took them to the house. The janitor expected to see Preston's wife there, but there was no one inside. After placing the grocery bags on the table, Austin led Haley into the bedroom. Here, the closet is here. There must be some of his daughter's clothes, and since you're her twin, you must have about the same size. Leaving the girl to change, he went to the kitchen to cook something. Meanwhile, Preston went to the detective he had hired to find his daughter. Hello, Morgan, he said. I have both good and bad news. Good afternoon, Preston, replied the detective. Well, let's start with the good news. I found my daughter, but not Ashley. The other daughter, said the restaurant owner. What do you mean, not Ashley? Who is she? The detective asked in surprise. Her name is Haley, but she is also my daughter, Preston explained. So you had two daughters, said Morgan thoughtfully. I didn't know anything about that until today, and I'll be honest, I was a little shocked. It looks like Elaine kept her second child and didn't tell us. I got it, replied the detective. Well, what's the bad news? At that moment, the restaurant owner bowed his head and cried. His palms were clenched into fists, and he looked confused. Morgan, I think we should stop looking for Ashley, he suddenly suggested. I don't think Ashley's still alive. If she were alive, she would have shown up long ago. Most likely, after that accident, her body fell into the river, then was carried away by the current. And there are wild animals. And that's it. There is no chance to find her. You shouldn't think so, Preston. The detective stopped his gloomy thoughts. I wouldn't draw such conclusions. Especially since Ashley's body hasn't been found. Well, and besides, there were no personal belongings in the cabin of the car that was found in the river. Well, maybe she threw them away on the way. Preston said cautiously and uncertainly. No, she would keep the purse anyway. The detective answered. You said that you had quarreled with her the day before she disappeared, and that Ashley had threatened to go to her boyfriend's house. Yes, that's what happened, he said. Well, that means she wouldn't have gone to him without her personal belongings, the detective went on. Besides, we found out that Ashley had withdrawn a large sum of money from her account that day. I was informed of that said Preston with sadness in his voice. You know, I think I have a plan to find Ashley. Haven't we tried everything already? The visitor inquired with surprise. I was thinking about it for a long time, and I came to the conclusion that your daughter did not disappear anywhere, continued the detective. Most likely, she is alive and you torture yourself in vain. How is that possible? Preston did not stop. It's very simple. Morgan got up from his chair and walked to the window. In my practice, there was a case when a woman came to me. She was also looking for her daughter, who had disappeared. I created a plan, involved the right connections, and spent a lot of time. And what, did you find the girl? Preston interrupted him. Yes, we found her, answered the detective. But it turned out that this way she wanted to teach her mother a lesson. The girl deliberately ran away from home just to be with the man she loved. They had been hiding in an old woodman's cottage out of the city for several months. And that's where they were found. They said they would return home after a while. So you think Ashley might have done the same thing to me? Preston asked, not believing what was happening. Everything is possible. I don't rule it out. Morgan answered quietly. 
This is why I suggest a unique plan. There will be a report on TV that your daughter has been found, and your photo with Haley will be published in the local newspapers. But that's not exactly true. The restaurant owner wanted to object. Listen to the end, please. The detective objected. Yes, I'm sorry, Morgan. I just still can't come to my senses. And you're right. Haley is my daughter too, and she looks like Ashley. Exactly! No one would notice the difference, exclaimed the detective. Haley's pictures will be in all the newspapers. But she is pregnant. That's all right. Your daughter disappeared a year ago. No one knows what happened to her during that time. That's right. Anything could have happened during that time. Preston agreed with the detective. Anyway, I'll take care of the newspapers. Do you think it will work? Preston asked, hopefully, just in case. We don't have any other options. I think this should work in your case. The detective reassured him. Morgan wasn't sure about his idea, but he had to try it, especially since he had no other options left anyway. That same day, he arrived at the publishing office where his friend worked. Hey John, can you do me a favor? Again? Do you want me to do some publicity for yourself? No, I need to publish this article. The detective gave him the text, and Preston had already sent him the full-length photos of Haley by email. And who is it? Do I know her? The editor asked sneeringly. Well, of course you do. It's Blankenship's missing daughter, replied the detective with a slight smile. Come on! Has she been found? John wondered. That's right. And the rich daddy wants to share this news with the whole city. Well, who cares? Just take the money and go ahead and post it. Morgan interrupted him sharply. All right, whatever you say, said John. A couple of hours later, a report was shown on TV. And by evening, the newspapers had already published an article. The detective had done his best. And now, all they could do was wait. The waiting depressed Preston, for he continued to think that Ashley was dead. Despite the detective's statements, Haley was worried too, for if the plan worked, she would have to meet her twin sister. She tried to think of what she would say to the sister she had never met, but Haley didn't know where she would begin. Austin offered his support in this endeavor. Don't worry, the main thing is to find her and then you'll find common ground with her. I hope so, Haley said uncertainly. I'll be there for you, Austin said, winking at her. In the time they had known each other, the guy got used to the girl. And after Haley had cleaned herself up and changed into new clothes, it was hard to call her a beggar. All that was left of her former life was a skinny body and a rounded belly. And if you didn't look too closely, Haley was no different from Ashley. As Preston said, she had been the same shape before she disappeared. Everyone waited impatiently to see if the article would work. As the detective said, if Ashley is alive, she will show up soon. If she's not imprisoned or something like that, she can't ignore such news. As a result, Two days later, a miracle happened. Ashley was found. Preston was just chatting with the detective in his restaurant when his phone received a call from an unknown number. Hello? A moment's pause. And the restaurant owner dropped his cell phone on the floor. It's Ashley. She's alive. He muttered and almost fainted. Luckily, the detective managed to catch him and pick up the phone. Ashley Blankenship, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine, said a gentle voice on the other end. And who is this? I'm Detective Morgan Page. Your father hired me, he answered. I see. Tell him I'm all right and I'll be there soon. Ashley muttered and disconnected. Well, what did she say? Preston asked, looking at the detective with crazy eyes. We must wait. 
She promised to come back soon, replied Morgan calmly. In the evening, a white car stopped outside Preston Blankenship's house, and Ashley got out, accompanied by a young guy. They were holding hands, which indicated that there was a relationship between them. Preston came out to meet them, leaving Haley inside. Daughter, what have you done to me? Why? Crying, he tried to hug her, but ran into her rounded belly. Daddy, let's go inside and I'll explain everything, or the neighbors will see me, she suggested. I feel so ashamed I shouldn't have done that. In a minute, all three of them were sitting in the living room. Preston couldn't stop looking at his daughter. He hadn't seen her in over a year, but it seemed like an eternity. Ashley, on the other hand, acted calmly as if nothing had happened. I'm sorry for what I did to you. She began to apologize. I just wanted to live with Lewis, and you wouldn't let me because he's from a poor family. Besides, I'm pregnant and we're expecting a baby. I'm sorry, honey. The father answered tearfully. I just wanted you to be happy. Yes, I understand that. But Lewis is my happiness, and you didn't even try to listen to me. Ashley said. I didn't think he was a decent guy and that he was serious about you. Dad tried to justify himself, and you didn't even give me a chance to think about it. Well, what was I supposed to do in that situation? You're right. You might not have had any other choice. Ashley answered. If mother had been alive, you would have found a compromise with her. Yes, Brienne knew how to find the right solution. He agreed. We've been living in another city all this time. Lewis suggested we stop hiding and go home. But you know me, I'm stubborn. Yes, you have my temper, her father said with a smile. I was out of control when I was your age, too. My parents couldn't cope with me and often sent me to my grandmother for re-education. So she kicked the crap out of me. I'm sorry again, Dad, Ashley answered hugging her father. Don't be mad at me, please, Lewis said. Come on, let bygones be bygones, Preston replied. Well, now tell me whose picture was in the article, said Ashley with a mysterious smile. Well, I'll introduce you to her in a moment, Preston said and went off to the back room. A minute later, Haley came out, accompanied by Austin. Ashley rounded her eyes and whistled. Wow, she looks just like me. Is she an actress? No. She is your sister, her father answered. Haley sat down on the couch, and Ashley took a seat a little away. They stared at each other. It was as if they were comparing each other's appearance to make sure they looked alike. Finally, Ashley couldn't stand it and hugged Haley. Sis, I'm so glad we found each other. Tears came pouring out of her eyes. And I'm glad too. Haley replied, crying with her in unison. Austin, Lewis, and Preston went to the kitchen to give them a chance to talk privately. Preston, I mean, Dad, has already told me everything, Haley said. My mother gave him and his wife one girl, and she kept the other. The sisters told each other how they had lived all this time, and it turned out that their fates were similar in some ways. There was a constant emptiness in both of them, as if they intuitively suspected that their second half was nearby. Not in the sense of a fiancé, but in the sense that they had no opportunity to fully enjoy life. It is not for nothing that they say that twins have a spiritual connection and they felt each other at a distance. Thus, Preston found two daughters at once, and both turned out to be pregnant as if they had agreed on it beforehand. Overjoyed, Preston allowed Ashley to get married to Lewis, even though they were already living together. But for the relationship to be serious, it had to be formalized. As for Haley, she was surrounded by attention and care from Austin. For almost a month, each of them felt some new feelings 
until they realized they were made for each other. Especially since Austin has done so much for her and has actually become a family member during this time. And he honestly admitted that he fell in love with Haley and had no intention of giving her up. And he planned to accept the future baby as his biological baby and give the baby his last name. Without delaying, Preston, after all the preparations, arranged a fancy wedding for both daughters. They had a ceremony on the same day. The restaurant owner had taken care of that in advance. He also took care of the accommodation. He had a spacious apartment in the city and left the big country house to the newlyweds. There was enough room to accommodate the two families. After the wedding, they all moved there together. Preston made Lewis his personal assistant and transferred Austin to the security department. The boy asked about that. He just remembered the time he had taken the beggar woman into the kitchen. Also, Preston asked Haley to show him where her mother was buried. He decided to honor her memory. Then, he and Haley drove to her stepfather's house. The man, in his drunken stupor, didn't even realize who was standing in front of him. When Preston told him that Haley wasn't going to live here anymore, he realized that now he had no one who could bring him money and booze. He started yelling and cursing. There was nothing more to talk to him about. Haley and her father left this terrible place. Now she has a new life. Ashley and Haley were getting ready for childbirth, buying all the essentials for the little ones. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.